Hello, Dan Alasso again with History for Today. And today I am making another multi-part video for my modern world history students. This one about the somewhat troubled 19th century. So to begin, after the defeat of Napoleon, the second time at Waterloo in 1815, Europe sort of breathed a collective sigh of relief. The British, who had led the defense against this final invasion, chose St. Helena in the South Pacific as a permanent home for the former emperor. Napoleon was transported to the island administered by the East India Company in 1815, and he lived there for the rest of his life. He died in 1821 at the age of 51. Also in 1815, at the Congress of Vienna, the old ruling families of Europe got together to decide how they were going to restore what they thought of as peace and order. To a large extent, their priority was trying to restore the status quo ante, the situation before Napoleon, the social organization that had existed really even before the French Revolution. The brother of the executed king, Louis XVI, took the French throne as King Louis XVIII. The 17th in between had been the dead king's son, who had himself died in prison at the age of 10 in 1795. And Louis XVIII agreed to return all of the territories that Napoleon had conquered to the nations that had had them previously. As much as possible, the Congress of Vienna tried to turn back the clock and forget that the revolution and Napoleon had ever even happened, while at the same time trying to set up a balance of power that would check the possibility of another French imperial resurgence. The European-wide peace that they established actually held until World War I began 99 years later in 1914. But too much had really changed to return to the past. Liberals tried to distance themselves from the social leveling and economic redistribution that the Jacobins had attempted. They tried instead to identify themselves with ideas like free trade and a limited voting franchise. But radicals pushed for greater equality and for more rights for regular people, especially workers. For example, British workers agitated for the right to vote and for a social contract called the People's Charter in the 1830s and the 1840s. But conservative Tories blocked the radical chartists. Enlightenment-inspired ideas about democracy and popular sovereignty and new ideas like socialism all came to a head in Europe by 1848, which was known as the Year of Revolutions. The Irish famine caused by a blight that made potatoes inedible began in 1845. Potatoes had proved to be an ideal crop for Ireland. But unfortunately, where the people of the Andes had grown hundreds of different varieties, the Irish and actually Eastern Europeans as well grew only one variety, the Irish lumper. And losing this important food source was disastrous for Irish peasants. British government aid was incompetent and ineffective and revealed a scandalous level of prejudice against the Catholic Irish. Over a million people in Ireland died because of the famine, and a million more emigrated to avoid starvation, mostly to the United States. The population of Ireland, which had been more than 8 million in 1841, never fully recovered. It's still only 4.7 million today. Food shortages spread to Scotland and Central Europe, where the Czech potato harvest was also reduced by half because of this blight. In addition to these rural famines, a lot of Britain and parts of Europe had begun to industrialize, and poor urban workers were dissatisfied with their wages and their living conditions, which I'll talk about in a bit. In 1848, rebels temporarily took control of Vienna, and they forced the Austro-Hungarian Empire to end serfdom. Southern Italians revolted against the French, who were still occupying their homeland. And a new revolution in France ended the monarchy once again and created the Second French Republic. Although revolutionary movements in the German states were less successful in changing their governments, they paved the way for changes and they resulted in massive German immigration to the United States. I'll talk about this immigration next, but before I do, a question for discussion. 
Why were the European rulers so eager to return to the conditions before the French Revolution? 